Hello, you've reached Gloria with Farmstead Talk, and I am here today with Samantha. She is from Homegrown in Illinois, and of course, she's representing her state of Illinois today in this homesteading interview. Thank you for joining me, Samantha. How are you this morning? Thank you for having me. I'm very good. Good, good. Um, would you like to share with the audience where they can find you on social media? You can find us on Instagram and Facebook at Homegrown in Illinois. Okay, very good. So if you would, tell me a little bit about yourself, a little bit about your family and where you're currently living. Um, I'm Samantha, my husband is Mark. Um, he's unable to be with us today. Uh, we have three children together and um, last year, my brother and sister came to live with us. Okay. We're in Northern Illinois um, and we live in a small, a small tiny town. <laughs> okay, so tell, let's talk a little bit about that community. Um, what's the population there, would you say? Um, I would say extended when you go out into the country, um, about 850 residents in our township. Um, in our small little area, it's about probably 250. Okay, that's pretty small. So do the people, do you know many of your neighbors there? Um, yeah, we go outside. We spend a lot of time outside, so we end up running into each other or just meeting outside and chit chat. Okay. The reason I ask is I'm wondering if there's like like-minded people where you live or people that support you in your homesteading venture. We do have a few neighbors um, who also do gardening. Um, some do bees. Um, we do share property with a large farm field. Um, we butt up against each other, but mostly in the, our extended area, a lot of the next towns over, they do have city farmers markets during the warm months, but uh, a lot of people seem really disconnected from their food source here. Okay, well, let's talk a little bit about that. What growing zone are you in? We are in 5B. Okay. So tell me a little bit about the types of gardens that you've had in the past and the methods that you use. Um, in the past, 2011, 2012, we lived in a small town near where we are now, and we would do things in pots or um, we might grow a, a pumpkin or a watermelon, just anything we could on the very small amount of property that we had to plant on. Um, in 2017, we bought this home and we're on just under two acres. Um, our first garden in 2018 here had, was a thousand square feet and it was tilled and ground. Um, at the end of 2018, we made a transition and started using raised beds. We were able to find cinder blocks in our community for free and we took advantage of that. Um, right now we have about 2,500 square feet in raised beds. And this year, uh, 2019, that's what we used. In 2020, we'll also be extending about 500 square feet outside of that garden uh, for vining squash and large melons. Okay, and what would you say is the biggest success in your gardens where you're growing at? We have a really, really when great time. When things go well. When, when things, things go well. When things go well, um, tomatoes and peppers we have an amazing time with. They grow great here. Um, you know, there, there's there been times that make that a little difficult, but we find success no matter what happens. Okay, so the reason I stressed when things go well is because you had told me about uh, an event that happened last year, last growing season, and that has really caused a lot of chaos in your in your garden last year. So you want to go ahead and share that story with us? Sure. In our first garden in 2018, we experienced something strange on some of our tomatoes. And I didn't really understand at that time what was happening because we were new to the property. I had never seen anything like it before. And we just continued the season as is. Um, in 2019, however, we experienced uh, herbicide drift from the farm that we share a property line with. <clears throat> in 
and um, unfortunately we lost over half of our garden um, because it was unsafe. Unfortunately with um, herbicide drift you never know how much of the chemical got inside of your plant without testing each individual plant and so you have to be very cautious. Um, we reached out to the EPA. Well, first we reached out to the farmer, but he was very- well, Wait, let me back you up for just a second. How do you know yeah. that it was her herbicide drift? I actually viewed uh, the farm field being treated with chemicals. Um, I made a note of the date and time and what that allowed me to do when you have to report to the EPA, you have to have an idea of when the field was sprayed that would have caused you damages. Um, when I actively saw this happening, I sent a text message out to my husband, which thankfully was a very good record of the date when the injury occurred to our property. Um, this is the second time. The first time uh, I did reach out to the farmer, he was very dismissive of what I was claiming was happening. And so the second time I avoided contacting him at all and I just reached out to the EPA. Um, so the let EPA. me just stop you real quick. So sure. when you witnessed that happening, you were actually in the presence of the drift, correct? Yes. So you actually had told me that something also occurred to you, right? You wanna yes. share that? Um, the first time that they sprayed, when I did reach out to the farmer, I had headphones in and was in the garden and cleaning it up. Um, we had a really late, um, the gardener, the, you know, the farmers even had a really late planting date last year because we had a very, very wet spring. And so I was spending my time out there kind of buttoning up the beds and just making sure everything was ready. And with headphones in, um, you don't hear a lot. I didn't notice until the large machinery passed our tree line on the left side of our property. When I noticed he was there and had booms out and was spraying, I immediately popped up and waved my arms at him in hopes that he would pause and let me get away and inside the house. Um, unfortunately, he just waved, continued to pass by, and the way our beds are set up, I had to kind of bob and weave to get out of the garden. Um, and unfortunately, I couldn't make it out of the garden before he passed by. At that point in time, I could taste uh, the chemical in my mouth. You could smell it in the air. Um, it was infuriating, but also scary. Um, there are a you lot also, of, you also told me too that you think that there may have been a potential injury from that. Um, within, I would say within three weeks to a month after that event, I lost all hearing in my right ear for about three months. Um, it, I don't know, there's no explanation. I, it lasted until September. Um, September or mid-October when I was finally got my hearing back and thankfully I have it back still. I can't um, say that it was 100% the cause of experiencing that, but I found that the correlation of the timing pretty interesting. Yeah. So how did that actually impact that whole gardening year for you then? Um, we went from 56 tomato plants down to 17. Um, our potatoes had another month and a half left to grow. Um, the EPA, when they came out, they told us they thought the potatoes would be safe, even though we could see burn injury to the foliage. Um, they guaranteed us the tomatoes were not safe, any of them that showed any sort of damage. So the tomato plants had to go all of our cucumbers, all of our beans, um, bush beans, pole beans, melons, uh, celery, all the greens had to be um, removed. Um, I removed all of them, photographed all of them. And 
and then when the corporation that was hired to do that spraying came to see the damages that they had caused as well, they informed us that our potatoes were not safe for consumption. Um, and later that night, my husband shoveled out 100 pounds of potatoes that had to go into a burn pile. Yeah, that's so sad. It was, it was really devastating um, because we do work so hard and we grow all of our plants from seed. Um, so it was a lot of hard work that felt like it had been for nothing. Um, and then you know, also you were supposed to go to the farmer's market too as well, right? Yes, we had already paid um, where we live. You have to pay in March to sign up for that season's farmer's market. So we had already paid our fees. Um, we had bought our little son a farmer's market cart so he could sit along next to us and try and earn money by selling stuff from his own little bed. Um, it was pretty uh, sad. We couldn't in good conscience sell anything that we had grown in the garden to any consumer because we couldn't guarantee its safety. So what was the outcome of this whole event? Um, when we had the EPA here, we learned some important information. Um, they shared with us that putting up a fence to ensure that the booms were unable to cross into our property would probably be our best line of defense. Um, secondly, they let us know that if you put PVC piping up so that it's tall enough for the machinery to see, so that their machinery isn't hurt during this process, you can spray paint um, half of the post purple. In the state of Illinois, there was a law passed in 2011 where you could spray paint a tree or a post um, and basically what that signifies is no trespassing. We were told you could also spray paint half of that post yellow, and that allows the farmers and companies to know that you have um, sensitive things on your property, like sensitive crops or bees. Um, another great tool that they taught us about was Driftwatch, and you can find that at www.driftwatch.org. Um, in your state, you can list if you are a market gardener or if you have bees, you can list um, yourself on the site and companies and farmers can check this to see if there is anything that would be damaged. Um, when the company came out, he sat with us and he was very apologetic, um, which felt nice. Are you referring to the person that owns the land that did the spraying? Um, no. So the person that owns the land hires a co-op. Oh, I see. That's local. And those people are trained to handle those chemicals. I see. Um, so that co-op came out to inspect the damages that they had caused. Um, they did end up um, compensating us for the damages that they caused, which felt like a small win. Um, they guaranteed they weren't going to be using dicamba anymore on the fields near where we live. Um, dicamba is a really volatile chemical and given the right conditions after it's been applied to a farm field can move up to two miles within two weeks of its use. Um, so somebody may see a farm field being sprayed and then a week later allow their kids outside to play thinking that it's safe. Unfortunately, if the conditions are right, it could be very dangerous um, to children, to anyone really, animals, pets. It's pretty scary. Um, so he guaranteed us that he wouldn't be using that anymore, which we are thankful for. And they've agreed to contact us the week that they spray. So we have an opportunity if we have things in the ground to go out and cover and protect them um, for the day. So there were some wins. We did receive at the end of last year, a letter from the EPA letting us know that they had given a warning to this company uh, in my state. After a warning, if somebody else turns them into the EPA because this happens again, they'll be fined $25,000. Wow. 
What a story. Yeah. Wow, I'm sorry that's happened to you, but you know, the word is now hopefully going to be getting out and more people will hear what you just said. Um, what do you think the message will be to farmers and to ordinary growers when they hear this? What do you think that they'll get out of this message that you're saying today? I hope that the biggest message that either person receives <clears throat> is understanding and respect. So I, I feel it's very important. We respect that farmer's field. Um, when I did reach out to him, he mentioned he was concerned that people were going to try, or we were going to try and damage his equipment, which is very expensive, by putting things into his field. I reassured him that that was not who we were or what we were about. Um, it didn't really seem to get me any headway with that person. But um, had, I, had he listened when I reached out to him the first time, the second incident may have never happened. And had he respected our property the same way we were respecting his, that incident might not have occurred. It might have saved this company a lot of headache, a lot of um, time. It, it could have benefited so many people. Um, so I really think and hope that a mutual respect, understanding that we all may not be happy what's happening in big ag currently, but understanding that it is many people's only form of income for their family. Um, and to be honest, that a lot of our systems to feed people in the United States require what they're doing and using because the demand for feed for animals is so high so I, I'm hoping, I, I, we're not the type to be after the farmer, but we are the type that understands if we want something to change, we have to start by changing it in our own home first, um, giving ourselves the best food that we can by growing it ourselves and taking pride in what we do and sharing our message with other people in hopes that maybe something does click and resonate with them and that they will join in this with us because it's really great when you meet people and especially in your own area, if you can meet people that are like-minded and really want to take part and join in on something that you're passionate about. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, I know last year's farmer's market didn't go over for you. So what is your goal for the farmer's market this year? Um, we kind of questioned with the addition of two extra children in the house and sports during the summer if it was going to be something we wanted to try and do again this year. But we have decided to stick with our goals that we originally set, and that included doing the farmer's market um, along with saving a lot of seed and maybe offering to people here things that they can't you know, they don't normally see plants, they don't normally see in hopes that maybe we do add more people to our flock. Okay. So what was your experience with um, food preservation? I know that we talked a little bit about food preservation and what, what, how to utilize your crops after the end of the year. Tell me what your favorite types of uh, food preservation are and how did you learn those skills? As a child, um, my mother had a garden and so did my grandparents. Um, but my mother <clears throat> would preserve salsa and stewed tomatoes, basically. That was really the only thing she made um, from her garden. And so I kind of wanted to preserve as much of this food as possible. So we dehydrate things, we uh, water bath can, we pressure can, we freeze, basically any means of preservation. We've even done water glassing of eggs um, in, order to, yeah, in order to last us uh, through the winter. So we try and, and take advantage of every opportunity to preserve anything that might help give us good healthy food for as long as possible. Nice. Um, what is the biggest lesson that you believe that your kids are learning there on the homestead? I think they're learning a few things. Um, one would just be that you can't sit around in the house and expect something that you want to come 
to fruition. You have to get up, you have to do the work. Um, and the harder you work, the more it pays off. You know, we're in February right now, the middle of February, and last night we ate spaghetti for dinner. And that came from, the sauce came from our garden still. So even, even though we're in the middle of the winter, they're still reminded when we go back and get an onion out or when we go and get something else that we preserved or chicken broth, um, any of those things, they're reminded each time that our hard work during the summer created that for us. Um, they also realize that because we do that often, um, there's always food here to eat. And I think that they really learn um, responsibility and understanding what good food, healthy food actually tastes like versus the very disappointing fruits and vegetables from the store. Right. It's definitely a, a different taste, isn't it? For yeah. sure. Um, <clears throat> what about the goal for the future of your homestead? Where do you see yourself in five years with the homestead? Right now, we are continually expanding the garden. I think my husband rolls his eyes at me every time I buy another pack of seeds or another plant. Even though we have as much land as we do, he's like, where do you plan on putting that? And he knows it's just like one more item on his honey-do list. <laughs> but he happily smiles and goes and does whatever it is. That's um, nice. <laughs> it really That's is. That's nice that you have a supportive partner that helps you in the endeavor. Oh, yes. he He's more of the facilitator, and I'm the dreamer and planner. And so, And then we do all the rest of the work. 50-50 even and work together. Um, we have laying chicks that will be coming on April 8th or 9th this year. Uh, we have yet to be able to build the coop that they're gonna go in because we're waiting for the snow to finally thaw. Um, but they will be here. And as long as we enjoy the process of raising them, we will probably plan on doing meat chickens um, maybe this fall or maybe next year, depending on what our availability is like. Um, we always plan to continually extend more gardening, adding more flowers. That's where I really lack. I'm not good at growing flowers. So I'm trying to learn more about that and be better. One day at a time, you know, we don't yeah. know. We don't know what we know, don't know until we do it and learn about <laughs> it. And right. it all comes with time. We just want to be really great stewards to any animals, any people that live here, and to our neighbors. So getting ready to wrap up, if you can sum up your homesteading experience in one word, what would that word be? I think it would be fulfilling. Definitely a fulfilling experience, isn't it? Yes. So I'm so sorry that this incident that you shared today with us happened to you, but I got to say that it, in the long run, it will probably do more good than it did bad because I think that message is going to get out and it's going to cause awareness. And any time that we can cause awareness to help our mother earth and to people, I think it's a good thing. So again, I'm sorry, but hopefully it will bring on some change, right? So, I hope so thank you for joining me today. It was a lovely interview. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.